We'll call tonight's message, The Bride and the Beloved. Revelation chapter 2. Under the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, that walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know your works and your labor and your patience, how you cannot bear them which are evil. You have tried them which say they are apostles and are not and have found them liars. You have borne, had patience for my name's sake, have labored and have not fainted. Nevertheless, even though you've done all of these things, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. People that labored for God, that bore tribulation for his namesake and trials and mockings, people that could not bear people that were evil, People that tried them, that said they were apostles and were not, found them liars, that patiently labored in the gospel, patiently doing the word, labored and not fainted. He said, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember from where you are fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. God called his people to repent, even though they seemed, everything seemed right. They seemed to be doing the works. They hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans, the people who were out to conquer other people. He hated all of these. And yet, there was something missing. There was something wrong. And they had fallen. They had been in a high place and they had come down from it. Because they had left their first love. Song of Solomon. The Song of Songs. Which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For thy love is better than wine. Let him, the Lord Jesus Christ, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. Let him embrace me, let him talk to me one on one. Let us be close, let us feel the love of God, let us feel intimate with one another. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For thy love is better than wine. Thy love is better than the fruit of the vine. Thy love is better than all this earth has to offer. The love of God is the greatest thing. There's nothing above it. You can do many things. You can have faith. You can prophesy. You can have a word of knowledge. You can move mountains. You can do religious works. You can give your body to be burned. But if you don't know the love of God, you're nothing. It profits you nothing. You're like a clanging cymbal. Remember wherefrom you are fallen. It says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his lips. Thy love is better than wine. To feel your love, to feel your presence, to know you're pleased, to talk with you, to pray to you, to praise you, just to be with you. This is how people in love, they, that's all they want to do is just to be with each other. They don't even have to be doing anything in particular. They just want to be with each other. Thy love is better than wine. I just want to be with you, Lord. I just want to be where you are. I just want to walk where you're walking. I just want to do what you want me to do. I just want to feel your presence. Kiss the sun. Let the sun kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. For his love is better than wine. His love is better than all this false love this earth out here offers you. 
They offer you riches. They offer you praise. They offer you fame. They offer you their false love, their false companionship. Thy love is better than wine. It's better than all this earth could offer. It's better than anything. To just walk with Jesus. To feel His presence. To know He's Lord. To know that you're His and He's yours. Because of the savor of your good ointments, your name is as ointment poured forth. Therefore do the virgins love thee. The undefiled, the pure, the ones who want God. It says, because of the savor of your good ointments, because of the savor, the smell, the odor, the feeling, the coolness of your ointments. Your name is His ointment poured forth. That's why the virgins love thee. They love your name. It says in John 12 and verse 3 that Mary, this was when Jesus was getting ready to offer Himself, then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped His feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said Jesus, against the day of my burying, has she kept this. When she anointed the feet of Jesus with spikenard, it says, the smell of it filled the house. When you come and worship God, when you come and bow at the feet of Jesus Christ, when you walk in the footsteps of Jesus, and when you make love to God, it fills the house with a savor. When you come together like this to worship God in the house of God, and each of you is making love to God, it fills the house with a savor, with an odor. Just one person can get that spark begin to turn loose. The others around them can begin, they can feel it. They can, there's a spiritual power turned loose. There's this presence of God, a holiness, an ointment poured forth. And they can begin to feel God moving on that person and it stirs them if their heart is right and they begin to worship and they begin to give off the savor. And it ascends up to God and His name is like ointment poured forth. It says she anointed him against the day of his burying. Many people talk about the power of the name of Jesus. They make it like a magic formula or a magic word, Jesus Christ, to just say the words. It says his name is like ointment poured forth. He poured everything. He poured his whole blood, his whole body. The water flowed out of him his whole life. He poured it all forth for us. He was a sweet savor to God for us to fill the house of God with power, to fill the house of God with love, to fill the house of God with the presence of God. He poured it all forth His whole life. He went to the cross. He gave it all. He paid the price. His name is like ointment poured forth. He gave it all. He poured everything He had to living for God. He poured everything He had for our sakes, for His love with wherewith He loved us. He put it all into the life He led here upon this earth. He put it all into pleasing God. It filled the house. And His name is like ointment poured forth. That name, the name of Jesus, it says He's been given a name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and earth and under the earth. A name above principalities, a name above powers. Because the Son of God poured Himself forth upon this earth. He gave it all for God. He paid the full price, the ultimate price. He gave His life. He felt all the suffering and all the anguish and all the pain and all the sickness. He gave everything. And God gave Him a name above every name. He said, Son, your name is like ointment poured forth. When people hear the name of Jesus, therefore do the virgins love thee. When they hear the name of Jesus, it moves something in them. 
It isn't just a word. There's even in other countries, there are people named Jesus. Children, they name them Jesus. Jesus Smith. Or Jesus so-and-so. It's not just the letters. It's not just saying the name. But Jesus Christ. He is like ointment poured forth. And if you know Him, and you know His power, and you know His Word, when you say that name, there's a power behind it. It's like ointment poured forth. It goes out and heals the sick. It goes out and heals the brokenhearted. It goes out and soothes the wounds. It goes out and gives life. And it fills the house with fragrance. It fills the house with the glory of God. When you can say the name of Jesus and there's love behind it, Hallelujah, saints of God. It can stir the heart of a child of God. It can help them if they're feeling down, if they're feeling beaten back. You can just say the name of Jesus with love. It can stir their hearts. They can feel the Lord move upon them. Therefore do the virgins love thee. Draw me. We will run after thee. Hallelujah. Draw me. We will run after thee. Draw me. We love him because he first loved us. Draw me, Lord. Help me, Lord. I want to follow you. I've heard your name. I know what you did at the cross. I want the Holy Ghost. Draw me. But then when God begins to move, we will run after thee. God and man, together, working together. God, draw me, and I'll run after you. God won't do everything. You can't just sit there and expect God to move on you and God to perfect you. God will draw you. You run after Him. God will move. When you feel the Spirit move, move with the Spirit. When God begins to move, say, yes, Lord. Then run. Then you're running after Him. My soul, it thirsteth after the living God. It pants for God. I look for God in a dry and thirsty land. I'll run after Him. If I feel the water, if I can taste just a little bit, if I can smell the water, I'll run after it. Draw me. Yes. Draw me. We'll run after Thee. It says in James 4, 8, draw nigh to God and He'll draw nigh to you. Say, I don't feel like God's moving upon me. Draw nigh to God. Then you begin to move toward God. And He'll begin to move toward you. Draw me. We will run after Thee. God, I don't want to be cold. I don't want to be cold inside. I don't want to just try the apostles. I don't want to just... Be out here laboring, having patience and bearing for your name's sake, but feeling cold inside? Draw me. We will run after you. Draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. God will be with you while you're with Him. Say, I don't feel God moving like I used to. Well, shake yourself. Find out what's wrong in your life. Find out what's separating between you and God and shake it off. Push through it. Get rid of it. Draw nigh to God. He'll draw nigh to you. You'll begin to feel God move. Draw nigh to God. The living God. Move. If you're saved, get the Holy Ghost. If you got the Holy Ghost, get into the Word. Draw nigh. Move. Spend the time. Pay the price. Do what it takes. We will run after Thee. We won't walk. We're going to run. We're going to push. We're going to move. We're going to stay with You. If You go leaping on the mountains, we're going to go leaping on the mountains. We're going to stay with You. We're not going to let You go. Jacob wrestled all night long with the man. He said, I won't let you go till you bless me. I won't let you go. Draw nigh to God. God, I've got your word. God, I know what to do. I won't let you go. I'm following. I'm going. I'll run after you. And God will draw you. You'll work together. You're not out there alone. We aren't living this life alone. God hasn't just given us His Word and said, here's the Word, and stood back and said, now, do your best. 
It says he went and worked together with them, confirming the word with signs following God and man, moving together, laboring together, working together, helping each other. It says the king hath brought me into his chambers. Glory to God. The king. The King of glory, the exalted, risen Christ has brought me into His chambers. What does this mean? It means He's brought you into the deep things of the Word, into the deep things of the Spirit. He's brought you close. He's brought you close to Himself, to where you can feel, you know He's right there. You know He's right there speaking to you through the Word. You know He's right there, whatever you're facing, wherever you are. You're in His chambers. You're with the Lord. Hallelujah. You can feel Him breathing upon you. You can feel His love stirring in your heart. When the Word, every time as your eyes pour over the Word, it leaps out, it comes alive. You're in His chambers. You're making love to Him and He's making love to you. The King has brought me into His chambers. Why? How did she get there? Draw me. We will run after you. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his lips. His love is better than wine. His name is his ointment poured forth. And the king looked down upon that and he said, Come into my chambers. That's the kind of person I'm looking for. That's the kind of person I want. Come with me. Step up into God. Step into the deep things of God. We will be glad and rejoice in Thee. We will remember Your love more than wine. They upright love Thee. It says, we will be glad. We'll rejoice in Thee. We'll remember Your love more than wine. The upright love Thee. The upright are the ones that love God. When you obey His Word, that's the love of God. When you rock uprightly, that's the love of God. And when you love God, you walk uprightly. It works together. The upright love thee. They'll be glad. They're going to rejoice in thee. In thee. In Jesus Himself. In that name that was poured forth. In Jesus. In who He is. In the mighty Son of God. In the mighty Word of God. We'll rejoice in that. That's our joy. That's our gladness. That's what we want. It says, now in the chambers, as God begins to move upon your life and reveal Himself to you when your heart is right, He begins to reveal the things that have hindered you and the things that have held you back so that you can come even closer, so that you can penetrate deeper. I am black, but comely. O you daughters of Jerusalem, as the tents of Kedar, as the curtains of Solomon, look not upon me because I am black, because the sun has looked upon me. My mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards. But my own vineyard have I not kept. This is what she says in the presence of the king, in the chambers of God. I'm black. I'm like the tents of Kedar. Where did she get black? It tells you right here. The sun has looked upon me because my mother's children were angry with me and made me the keeper of the vineyards. My own vineyard have I not kept. She was out in the sun keeping the vineyards. Her mother's children put her out there. Now who are the mother's children? Remember, God is our Father. Jesus is our Savior. And the Holy Ghost is a comforter. The Holy Ghost is the one that comforts us. The Holy Ghost is the one that moves upon the seat of the Word to bring Jesus in our lives. To make us into His image. It's the Holy Ghost. 
And the children of the Holy Ghost are the ones that have been born of the Spirit. And they were angry at me and made me the keeper of the vineyards. Now, God has many children upon this earth that have been born of the Spirit. But they don't really want to go all the way with God. And when somebody starts crying out for God, for the fullness of God, for all that God has, kiss me with the kisses of your mouth. I want to know that name. I want to walk in uprightness. Draw me, we will run after thee. Then they begin to get angry and they begin to get stirred up. They say, why, get out and work for the Lord. Get out and do something for God. Luke 10 and verse 38. It says, it came to pass as they went that Jesus entered into a certain village and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house and she had a sister called Mary that also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and she came to Jesus and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. See, both of these were children of the covenant, but the one was cumbered about much serving and the other just wanted to sit at Jesus' feet and hear his word and be fed on the word. And so she came to him and she said, would you tell her to help me? We got a work to do out here. We got a service to do. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. She chose it to sit at his feet and hear his word. She chose not to go out and try to save the world. She chose not to get involved in religious activities. She chose to sit at His feet and hear His Word. She's the one, saints of God, it says, Then Mary brought the pound of ointment of spikenard, very precious, and anointed Jesus' feet. And the smell filled the whole house. She was the one that wanted to walk with God, all the way with God, that wanted to be drawn into the deepest portions of Jesus Christ, to be one with Him, to hear His Word, to bow down and listen to every word that came out of His mouth, to love and to adore Him and to anoint Him. So my mother's children were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards. They said, go out and keep the vineyards. Go out and lead other people to the Lord. Go out and teach these people the Bible. Get involved in Sunday school. You've got to work for God. You've got to do something now that you're saved. You don't have time to spend all your time just singing and praising God and getting into His Word and listening to His Word. Said, but my own vineyard I didn't keep. So she went out and got busy. Busy with her children in her house. Busy with a job. Busy in religious activity. Busy, careful with the cares of the world. Keeping the vineyards. Yes, I'm out working for the Lord, being a good testimony on my job. Yeah, I'm trying to do my best with these children and raise them up right. Yeah, I'm trying to serve the Lord. Go out in the mission field. Witness for Jesus. But I have someone against thee. Because thou hast left thy first love. Out keeping the vineyards. But my own vineyard I haven't kept. So is she draw an eye to God. And God says, keep your vineyard. Build the walls up around your vineyard. He says, I can see your heart. God doesn't look like man looks. 
God looks right beyond the outside and right down to the heart of man. That's why he could look on the church at Ephesus and say, I have something against thee. He says, he's the one that tries the hearts. He's the one that tries the reins. He's the one that sees through what man sees on the outside. You can be singing and praising God, but God sees your heart. God feels whether there's ointment poured forth. God feels, he knows what's behind it all. When she came into his presence, she said, I'm black. I've been out there keeping the vineyards. I've gotten hard. The sun has burned me. Cares of the world. Religiousness. Sin. Pride. Evil things have attached themselves to my life. And I thought I was out working for God. I'm black. And he says, but you're comely. Because your heart is right. I'm like the tents of Kedar. There were black goat skin tents that they made in Kedar. Black. He said, no, you're like the curtains of Solomon. The curtains that hang in the temple. Beautiful. I see your heart. She says, I see it now. I've been out in the vineyards, but my own vineyard I haven't kept. Repent and do the first works. Repent from where thou art fallen. And she begins to repent and turn back. And that good heart, that good ground that's in there begins to loosen itself of all these things out here in the world. Begins to get free and turn back to God and say, yes, you've drawn me. This is what I really want. It all begins to come off. Just like Isaiah, when he came in Isaiah, and he had seen the glory of the Lord and the King sitting upon the throne and the pillars of the house did shake. He said, woe is me. There he was in the presence of God in the chambers of the King. Woe is me. I am black. I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. And a man can think he's doing pretty well and moving on pretty high in God and start to get lifted up. But when he stands in the inner chamber, when he stands and feels the presence of God, when he stands before the burning bush, when he stands in the tabernacle, when the Holy Ghost begins to move, he'll know where he stands for sure. I'm black. I'm undone. I'm a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. What did God say to Isaiah? He took the coal and he purged him. He said, Isaiah, your overcomer material, your prophet material. But I have something that I need to do in your life. You're comely. You're like the curtains of Solomon. You're good heart, good material. But these outward things have attached themselves. The enemy has deceived you. He's burned you. You need to be healed. You need to be set on course. Your eyes need to be set on the King, the Lord of hosts. You need to be purged. Hallelujah. You need to keep your vineyard. Break up your fallow ground. Begin to bring forth fruit to God. Saints, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with working for God. There's nothing wrong with helping out in the vineyard. A man that loves God, a person that's close to God, is going to work for the Lord. Like it says in Song of Solomon 7 and verse 11, she says, Come, my beloved, let us get up early to the vineyards. Let us see if the vine flourish, the tender grapes appear, the pomegranates bud forth. There will I give thee my love. Concern for the vineyards, a laborer for God. But there was something, there was a difference between the way she moves here in one and the way she moves in seven. Because one is from a heart of love. Let's go out. This is my God's work. Let's go labor together. Let's go see the vineyards. Let's see if the vine is flourishing, the grapes appear. God, it's you and me. Let's go together and there I'll give thee my love, it says. 
concern for the body of Christ. Chapter 8 and verse 8. We have a little sister. And she has no breasts. What shall we do for our sister in the day when she shall be spoken for? How can we help? How can we draw these young ones in God and help them to be strong, Lord? What should we do? But this is after she's kept her own vineyard. After she's got her own life straightened out before the Lord. Now you can do a great God will use you where you are as much as He can. But there's a work to do in the heart of God's people. A drawing. A purging to clean them up for God. Then they'll go out with the Lord into the vineyard to see if the vines flourish. There's a time of separation. When the Word needs to come in and it needs to cleanse that blackness. It needs to cut away at sin. It needs to cut away at worldliness. It needs to cut away at religiousness. It needs to cut away at all the things that happened out there in the vineyards. To set up a wall about your own vineyard. To weed it out. To fertilize it. To water it. To bring forth fruit. It says in Song of Solomon 2 and verse 17. <clears throat> Until the day break and the shadows flee away. Turn, my beloved, and be like a rower, a young heart upon the mountains of Bether. Be like a rower, a young heart upon the mountains of Bether until the millennium. Until the kingdom, until I've taken on a glorified body, till the daybreak and all the darkness be done away, till the shadows totally be done away. Let's walk together upon the mountains of Bether. Bether means division or separation. Leading a separate life. Divided from the world. You're up on the mountains of Bether. You're, you're with God. You're one of God's children. You've come out from among her. You're separate. You're a virgin to the Lamb. You're clean. You're God's. You're God's property. And you won't be defiled with other lovers. You won't be defiled with other things. You're God's. You're His love. You're His one. You're His beloved. And you won't defile yourself with others. You won't defile yourself with sin. You won't defile yourself with the cares of the world. You won't defile yourself with anything that would put a wedge between you and God. You're going to walk on the mountains of Bether, upon the mountains of separation from the world, not upon the valleys of separation from God, not in the valley of the shadow of death, not in low points. With God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And she sees her need. She sees her need for the true living Word of God to do this. God, I'm black. He says, but you're comely. He says, you're mine. You're in my chambers. She says, God, I need your Word. Song of Solomon 1 and verse 7. Tell me, O thou who my soul loveth, where you feed, where you make your flock to rest at noon. For why should I be like one that turns aside by the flocks of your companions? Tell me, O thou whom my soul loveth, where's the word? Where are you feeding your people? Where's the true and the living word coming forth? Where can I be fed? Where can I find green pastures? Where can I find a place where the Word will come forth and help me walk? And help me stay in this place? And help me make love to you? And teach me the way I should go? Where are you feeding your sheep and making them strong? Where is the green pasture? Where are they resting at noon? Why should I be like one that turns aside by the flocks of your companions? 
I want to be part of your flock. I want you to feed me. Why should I go off and have a man feed me? Why should I turn aside by the flocks of a man and begin to follow a man? She says, I don't want that. I don't want to be following man. Even if they're your companions, I want to follow you. He said, if you don't know, O oh, fairest among women, See what he calls her? It says in the word he calls those things which are not as though they were. God looks on the heart. If a man's heart is after God and wants God, he says, Oh, thou fairest among women. He'll look out upon the body of Christ and he'll see those hearts that want to go all the way with him and he'll say, There's the fairest among women. Go your way forth by the footsteps of the flock. Feed your kids beside the shepherd's tents. It says in 1 John 2 and verse 5, Whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. Hereby know we that we are in him. When you love his word, when you keep his word, the love of God is perfected in you. That's why when you start to draw nigh to God, I mean, really begin to move for God. That's when you'll want this word. You'll thirst after this word. You won't be able to get enough of the word of God. And you'll want the true word. You won't be willing to settle for watered down stuff that they call the word. You won't be willing to settle for dry grass. You're going to want green pastures. You're going to want the true word. You're going to want the deepest word you can get your hands upon. You're going to want the word brought by the Spirit and nothing else is going to satisfy that kind of heart. Nothing else is going to satisfy that kind of longing save the true and the living and the abiding word of God. The kind of word that will perfect you. And the one that keeps that word in him, the love of God, is perfected. And she said, I don't want to be following some man. And what did Jesus turn right back and he said, If you don't know, O thou fairest among women, go your way forth among the footsteps of the flock and feed your kids beside the shepherd's tents to wait upon God. Go in the footsteps of the flock, the steps of Jesus. Where does the flock go? It follows in His steps. We'll get into the Word. Follow in the steps of Jesus. Follow after the shepherd. And the day will come. He said, you'll get to the right place. God will bring you to the right place. He'll feed you the Word. He'll feed it to you by the Spirit. And He'll bring you to a place where you can hear the true and living Word of God. He'll bring it to you. Feed your kids beside the shepherd's tent. He said, there are shepherds, there are true shepherds out there that are feeding my flock. You follow in my steps and you'll find them there. Hallelujah. You want to find the true shepherds? You want to find the true flock? You want to know where Jesus is feeding? Then don't follow in a man's footsteps. Follow in the footsteps of the flock. They're following in His steps. He's at the head of it. Begin to follow in the steps of Jesus Christ. And as you walk in those steps, you'll catch up with those that are walking in them. You'll find those that are walking in them. They'll be there too. He looks upon His little one. He says, I've compared thee, O oh my love, to a company of horses in Pharaoh's chariots. He says, you're strong. You have a zeal. Horses in the book of Revelation means strong spirit. There were many God looked upon. They were good. They were good horses for God. They could move for God, like Paul and Barnabas back there in the Word. There were men that had a zeal for God, but they were hooked up to the wrong thing. They were hooked up to Pharaoh's chariots. Not Solomon's. Not God's. They were hooked up to Pharaoh's chariot. We're going to have to break these chains. We're going to have to set you free. We're going to have to... Make these borders of gold with studs of silver. 
For your cheeks are comely with rows of jewels, your neck with chains of gold. We'll make thee borders of gold with studs of silver. We're going to have to hook you up the right way. We're going to have to get you yoked up to God, yoked up to Jesus, yoked up to His Word. We have to get you pulling the chariot of Solomon. Back there in the times, there was Paul and Barnabas. They had a zeal for God. Paul was out there persecuting the church. But he was hooked up to Pharaoh's chariot. He was hooked up to the false religious system. He wasn't doing a work for God. He was doing a religious work. God came down upon him. And he put the yoke of Jesus Christ about his neck. And he went to working for God. Barnabas went out and he preached the baptism of John because that's all he knew. And God had some servants come to him and explain to him the way of truth more excellently. And he went to working for God. And this is it. Many of God's people have a zeal for God but not according to knowledge. And they're pulling Pharaoh's chariots. They're pulling these denominational systems. They're doing a work for the world and they think they're pulling for God and they're not. They're pulling for the devil. He says, let's hook you up the right way. Let's put on you borders of gold with studs of silver. Let's redeem you. Let's bring you to God. Let's start pulling for God's kingdom. While the king sits at his table, my spikenard sends forth the smell thereof. When the king sits down to feed me the word, to fellowship with me in the word, my spikenard sends forth the smell thereof. Mary anointed his feet with spikenard and the odor filled the room. When God sits down to feed you this word that you've been looking for, when he hooks you up to his kingdom, when he gets you in a place with him where that old blackness can be changed and wiped away, and all the heat of the day, the heat of the sun, you found instead the shadow of a great rock in a dry and a thirsty land. Now you're sitting under the shadow of the rock. You're out of the heat of the sun, the sun of the devil, and you're under the sun of righteousness. You begin to heal, and you begin to get right with God, and you begin to set your footsteps in the steps of the flock that are following after Jesus, the virgins of the Lamb, and you sit to eat with the King. You feast upon the Word with Jesus Christ, and your spikenard sends forth the fragrance thereof. As you eat and feast upon the Word, something rises up, the love of God rises up within you. And it comes forth and God can smell the fragrance. It says, A bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me. He shall lie all night betwixt my breasts. My beloved is unto me as a cluster of camphor in the vineyards of Engidi. Hallelujah. It says, My well-beloved, my Jesus... He's a bundle of myrrh to me. He'll lie all night between my breasts. I'll hold him close, close to my heart. He's like a cluster of, of camphor flowers in the vineyards of Engidi. He's like a cluster of flowers that I put upon me to adorn myself with beauty. Behold, thou art fair, my love, Behold, thou art fair, thou hast dove's eyes. God looks upon his little woman who loves him so much, who's to him, to her, she, he is just everything. And he looks upon her and he says, And you are fair, my love. You are fair. Has God ever looked upon you? Have you ever felt God move upon you and say, Yes, you've done well? You are fair. You have dove's eyes. You have the Holy Ghost. Behold, thou art fair, my beloved, yea, pleasant. Also our bed is green. It said he'll lie all night betwixt my breasts. It says, you are fair, my beloved. She returns back the love of God. You are fair, my beloved. You're the fairest among ten thousand. 
There's none like you. You're the matchless Son of God. You're the Rock of Ages. You're the Rose of Sharon. You're the Lily of the Valleys. You're the Mighty God. You're the King of Kings. You're the Lord of Lords. You are altogether lovely. You are pleasant. Our bed is green. This green means life. Our bed produces life. The bed of a man and a wife, it produces life. It produces fruit that comes forth. Little children come forth from it. And when you move in with God and lie in His bed and speak to Him and feel His love, it brings forth fruit. It's green. It brings forth life in you. The life of God the life of the Son of God, it moves in you. It brings forth fruit. The beams of our house are cedar and the rafters are fir. The beams of our house are cedar. They're strong. Our rafters are fir. It's a strong. God is strong. This house He's building is strong. It brings forth life, but it's a strong covering too. A safe place for God's people to lie is with Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Safe from the devil. Safe from sickness and sin. The house of God, it's to have pillars in it. Strong ones who can stand back the evil forces. Who can stand back the one that tries to put a wedge between man and wife. Between Christ and church. Behold, thou art fair, my beloved, and pleasant. Also our bed is green. This is what God's Word says, saints. This is the life that we're to live. This is the kind of love that we're to have for our God. This is the kind of love that God has been looking for in this earth. This is the kind of love that He gave to us. And as you read over these scriptures here and meditate upon them, they go beyond. These scriptures here in the Song of Solomon are so deep. They move you in the Spirit. They move you into praise. They move you into the love of God. They go beyond what you can express in words. They produce a feeling inside of you. They do a work in you. Something like the Bride of Christ is going to have in this end time. This is the kind of love that she's going to walk in. This is the kind of life she's going to bring forth upon this earth. This is the kind of singleness. This is the kind of affection that she is going to have for her master. Something that nothing will come between. That she won't let anything come between. Thou hast dove's eyes. You are fair. You have the eyes of the Holy Ghost. And they're set on Jesus. It said He would come and bear witness of Jesus. If you have dove's eyes, your eyes are set on Jesus Christ. Upon the Son of the living God. Thou art fair, my beloved. Hallelujah. Praise God.